It's Lynn again. And in case you didn't know, I'm a YouTuber. I'm just a person who happens to, you know, talk to myself a lot on the internet. And because I have been doing it for nearly six years, almost seven now, I have some tips and tricks for how to film yourself and make your videos cinematic and specifically vlogs, because I think there is a unique structure to creating a vlog. There's a lot of challenges that comes with filming in public filming unexpected moments and knowing how to pull it together, make it feel cohesive. And it took me so long, many years of practice, trial and error, taking risks, experimenting to get where I am now. And where I am now is, um, I've definitely learned a lot, but I feel like I still have so much more to learn. For this video, I am teaming up with Epidemic Sound to bring y'all the challenge, Game Changer Sound Matters. If you don't know what Epidemic Sound is, this is where I get all my sound effects and music that I use in my YouTube videos. And we often underestimate the power of sound in a career or field that's dominated by visuals. Since I started YouTube, pretty much every single one of my videos start in the exact same way. It begins with the sound of crickets and a tape deck loading into a cassette player. The moment you hear those sounds, you know it's my video. And this stylistic choice is kind of like a producer tag, except instead of saying like another one or JYP, it's the sound of crickets and a tape deck. So here's a short sequence of how sound is such an important component of storytelling. I hope this inspires you to join the challenge that Epidemic Sound is hosting and that I will be judging. I'm gonna be one of the head game changers and alongside other head game changers and the Epidemic Sound creator marketing team, we will be picking a winner and there's epic prizes as the reward. You can join the challenge by uploading a 60 second video that emphasizes the importance of sound design and submitting it to the link in my description box. Be sure to let me know in the comment section if you'll be entering and if you have ideas. Thank you so much to Epidemic Sound for partnering with me for this video. So the video is gonna be split up into three sections, pre-production, filming, and then post-production. I have all my advice and tips and tricks written down here. So let's begin. Let's start off with pre-production. Believe it or not, I, I am a spontaneous person, okay? I like to have fun. I like to do things like on the whim, but most of the time, if you go into filming a video without some sort of at least mental plan, eh, I don't know. There's a lot more to making a cinematic vlog than just stringing together a bunch of aesthetic clips. And it starts with you asking yourself, what is your story? I have some examples written down, so it could be for documenting memories. A lot of my vlogs are just things I wanna look back on and digitally scrapbook for myself. One of the first videos I made vlog two. It's my California vlog where I went to Los Angeles and Orange County with my dad and my brother. Even though the video itself is not very technically advanced, the heart of the video is that it's sentimental. It's nostalgic. I wanted to create the snapshot in time. Location can be anything as simple as your home. You want to document like a morning routine or maybe you're traveling somewhere. Like when I went to Paris. I think all videos have messages, but ones that seem a little bit more argument based. For instance, my hobbies video from earlier this year. Sometimes I finish a movie and the thing I take away may not be something I saw visually, but it might be a song. I recently watched Anatomy of a Fall for the first time. And one of my biggest takeaways besides, you know, Swan Arlod being like the sexiest French man ever. <laughs> I would let that man defend me in court any day. But if you see Anatomy of a Fall, there is a version of 50 Cent's Pimp that is pretty instrumental in the film. <laughs> and I associate that song now with Anatomy of a Fall. And lastly, I've made a lot of videos based on references. For example, when I went to Europe last year, a lot of the locations and places I decided to visit were based on filming locations, inspiration for shows and movies I like. So essentially, 
essentially, you gotta figure out the purpose of your video. And once you have that cemented, you can figure out your shot list, maybe come up with a storyboard. When I went to Europe, I made Pinterest boards for all the videos I wanted to film. For Japan, it looked a little different. I had an itinerary. If you know that there are certain locations or monuments or places you wanna capture, it's good to plan that out ahead of time and check for the weather and make sure that you're bringing the right gear. So if you need like a wide lens, if you need lav mics, etc. This is the general sentiment amongst most creatives, but the equipment and gear you have does not make your video cinematic. It might help you with certain techniques. There's a lot of things that make life easier. Like if you have a camera with a viewfinder or an external monitor, you can see yourself. But also if you gave Lynn from like six years ago, the setup I have now, I would not be able to make the same quality videos because I had so much to learn regardless of the equipment I was using. I will have all my camera equipment linked down below though, I'm still relying on my Panasonic GH5. I've been using it since senior year of high school, this exact same camera. <laughs> and I'll include my mics, my vlogging cameras, other equipment. But I started by filming on a phone, just with like, you know, a little smartphone. And I'm still very proud of the videos that I was able to make back then. Now we're gonna talk about filming because filming yourself Oh my goodness. <laughs> it goes without saying that you should have a nice tripod. I love this one by Joby. I also have a smaller, more compact one, but this I use for my main camera. When I'm vlogging in public, I do try to be as inconspicuous as possible. So I prefer a tripod like this versus like a big extendable one, especially since you can bend the legs and then attach it onto like a fence or something nearby to elevate your camera or hold it up if you need to, or quickly be being able to take off the tripod if there is a bookshelf or a stand that you can rest your camera on to get the perfect angle. Even though there are people witnessing you setting up your little camera and you might feel a little bit shy and embarrassed, the most other people will think is like, oh, they're filming something and they're gonna forget they're not gonna care ever again. They're never gonna think of you again. You have to learn to let go the embarrassment of being perceived. I know being perceived is very scary. And obviously you should be mindful of your surroundings and the people around you. If it's not a good time to film, don't film. If it's disrespectful to film or you're not allowed to, don't, you don't need to whip out your camera. But if you're in a public space where it's okay to, do what you gotta do to get the shot that you want. I cannot tell you the things I have done. I have filmed in the rain. I've I've missed trains. I have done a hike two times over because I'll be like walking on the trail. I'll place my tripod down, walk, and then have to walk back to pick up my camera. <laughs> I always try to take multiple angles and takes as well because in post-production, it gives me more options. When you're filming yourself, you don't have a lot of options of camera movement. So I tend to rely on the diverse range of filming compositions I can use. I know we all have that one friend that we cannot ask to take photos of ourselves because they don't know how to angle the phone camera. They make me look like 5'3", and I am 5'3", but I wanna look at least 5'6". There's a lot of framing techniques that you can reference. Some of my favorites that I think are very simple and easy to implement, rule of thirds, symmetry, and love me a good wide shot. And besides capturing the shots that you may have planned out, a quintessential part of vlogging is that you have the skill of noticing things as they're happening. So whether it's a bird that landed near you like a pigeon or the sunset and the way the light is refracting on the water, if you're not present to witness, but also ready to record, you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss it and the camera's gonna miss it. Not a video, but one of my favorite photos I took while I was in Japan was in Kyoto. I was walking around the Imperial Palace grounds and some of the blossoms were blooming, but most of them were still budding. People were still out and about picnicking on the lawn and I noticed that there was this couple and I was like, oh, a couple, I'm reminded of how single I am and I'm alone traveling in Japan by myself. Oh, lovely. But there was this cute couple, they were on a picnic and I noticed that from my point of view, there were branches and there was a perfect little diamond cutout made by these crisscrossing cherry blossom branches. And if I just move slightly with my camera, they were perfectly centered. So yeah, that's just an example of like noticing things and being ready to capture it. I'm gonna be honest, when it comes to using a camera, I know near to nothing about the technical aspects and I need to work on that. <laughs> That's one of my goals actually this year. All my camera settings is like automatic 
autofocus. I don't even shoot in raw. I wish I could give you more advice on that, but other technical aspects I can give you advice on are sound and lighting. When I first started on YouTube, I was big into like the silent vlogs where it's just music. And to me, those environmental sounds that you capture while filming can add so much depth. It, it adds grittiness, texture that I really enjoy. So whether it's the morning birds chirping or the sound of your coffee machine grinding the beans, that can make a video cinematic. And I like to supplement those sounds in post-production with additional sound effects or recordings that I take after filming the main footage, which we'll talk about later. And lighting, I want to explore more how I can use studio lights, handheld lights, all that jazz to create more dynamic, dramatic, and interesting videos. But at the moment, I mostly use natural light. Working with natural light is both hard and easy. When you're out and about and the weather is inclement, it's bound to change. You might have to think quickly on your feet and know how to reposition your subject, whether that be an object or yourself, to make the best lighting composition in that moment. This is one of my favorite clips I took while I was in Japan. You start with the source of light, the window being far away and I'm backlit. And then we eventually move towards me being fully lit from the front by the window. I planned this in the moment in my head because I wanted there to be a progression. As we move further and further into the video, it's almost like the, the room and the story is opening itself up. So that's an example of how I utilize natural light cinematically. And then last but not least, let's talk about post-production. Out of all the aspects I've mentioned today, I think editing is the one I've spoken extensively about on my channel previously. Color grading and doing effects is really fun. I find a lot of joy in it and I think it's what I'm actually best at. But if you don't have the foundation of all the things I just mentioned, your post-production <laughs> process is gonna be tough, okay? I am so proud of how far I've come with color grading. I truly feel like I've developed a personal style and rhythm. I know how I want my blues and my greens to be. I finally understand the color curves. Oh my goodness, it took me so long. I was so fearful of them, but they totally changed the game. I love color grading that emulates film and film just reads cinematic to me. Obviously, I look to my favorite pieces of cinema to make my color grading more cinematic. I will continue to reference Studio Ghibli, but like Studio Ghibli and the color palettes, deeply influential in my work. This might be a random reference, but I also also enjoy the color grading into all the boys I've loved before. And I also have so many frames from Lady Bird Saved on my Pinterest. Portrait of a Lady on Fire, Everything Everywhere All at Once, two of my favorite films, and the special effects in Everything Everywhere All at Once, Mind blown. That movie set the bar so high of what you can do in Adobe Premiere. When you're rough cutting a video, sequencing is also very important. Are you moving forward? Are you moving backward? Are you moving around and then out as a whole? And last but not least, one of my favorite parts of post-production is cutting things to the music. Music can capture so much emotion and add so much more depth to your video. One of my favorite kinds of TikTok content are cooking videos where it's edited to popular sounds. What I do is I listen to the original sound recording of a video clip and think about how can I enhance this? Can I add a sound effect that adds a little bit of ambiance and texture? Is there a way to layer in an additional sound recording that emphasizes like a chopping sound? Can that chopping sound be done to the beat of a song? And those are my tips on tricks on how to film yourself and make your vlog cinematic. I hope you feel inspired and motivated and a little bit more confident to go and create what you love. Let me know if you enter the Game Changer Sound Matters Challenge with Epidemic Sound. I can't wait to look at y'all's submissions and be sure to leave any questions for me about the process down below. I'm happy to share, you know, no gatekeeping here and my Japan videos will be coming out soon. I'm gonna be working really hard on them for y'all and I can't wait to share my memories and the funny stories that I have from traveling. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see y'all in the next one. Love you, bye.